Hello friends, I welcome you to the fourth installment in this calm reading of Little Women. Tonight, I will be reading for you Chapter 5, Being Neighborly, as well as Chapter 6, Beth Finds the Palace Beautiful. Let us find a place where we can safely relax bed, your favorite chair, or perhaps your couch. Settle down, unwind, and let's begin these chapters. Chapter 5 Being Neighborly What in the world are you going to do now, Joe? asked Meg one snowy afternoon, as her sister came tramping through the hall in rubber boots, old sack, and hood, with a broom in one hand and a shovel in the other. Going out for exercise, answered Jo with a mischievous twinkle in her eyes. I should think two long walks this morning would have been enough. It's cold and dull out, and I advise you to stay warm and dry by the fire as I do, said Meg with a shiver. Never take advice, can't keep still all day, and, not being a pussycat, I don't like to doze by the fire. I like adventures, and I'm going to find some. Meg went back to toast her feet and read Ivanhoe, and Joe began to dig paths with great energy. The snow was light, and with her broom she soon swept the path all round the garden, for Beth to walk in when the sun came out, and the invalid dolls needed air. Now the great garden separated the March's house from that of Mr. Lawrence. Both stood in a suburb of the city, which was still country-like, with groves and lawns, large gardens, and quiet streets. A low hedge parted the two estates. On one side was an old brown house, looking rather bare and shabby, robbed of the vines that in summer covered its walls, and the flowers which then surrounded it. On the other side was a stately stone mansion, plainly betokening every sort of comfort and luxury, from the big coach house and well-kept grounds, to the conservatory and the glimpses of lovely things, one caught between the rich curtains. Yet it seemed a lonely, lifeless sort of house, for no children frolicked on the lawn. No motherly face ever smiled at the windows, and few people went in and out, except the old gentleman and his grandson. To Joe's lively fancy, this fine house seemed a kind of enchanted palace, full of splendors and delights, which no one enjoyed. She had long wanted to behold these hidden glories, and to know the Lawrence boy, who looked as if he would like to be known, if he only knew how to begin. Since the party, she had been more eager than ever, and had planned many ways of making friends with him. But he had not been seen lately, and Joe began to think that he had gone away. When she one day spied a brown face at an upper window, looking wistfully down into the garden, where Beth, and Amy were snowballing one another. That boy is suffering for society and fun, she said to herself. His grandpa does not know what's good for him, and keeps him shut up all alone. He needs a party of jolly boys to play with, or somebody young and lively. I've a great mind to go over and tell the old gentleman so. The idea amused Joe, who liked to do daring things, and was always scandalizing Meg by her queer performances. The plan of going over 
was not forgotten. And when the snowy afternoon came, Joe resolved to try what could be done. She saw Mr. Lawrence drive off, and then sallied out to dig her way down to the hedge, where she paused and took a survey. All quiet. Curtains down at the lower windows. Servants out of sight, and nothing human visible but a curly black head leaning on a thin hand at the upper window. There he is, thought Joe, poor boy, all alone and sick this dismal day. It's a shame. I'll toss up a snowball and make him look out, and then say a kind word to him. Up went a handful of soft snow, and the head turned at once, showing a face which lost its listless look in a minute. As the big eyes brightened and the mouth began to smile, Joe nodded and laughed and flourished her broom as she called out. How do you do? Are you sick? Lori opened the window and croaked out as hoarsely as a raven. Better, thank you. I've had a bad cold and been shut up a week. I'm sorry. What do you amuse yourself with? Nothing. It's Dollar's tombs up here. Do you read? Not much. They won't let me. Can't somebody read to you? Grandpa does sometimes, but my books don't interest him, and I hate to ask Brock all the time. Have someone come and see you, then. There isn't anyone I'd like to see. Boys make such a row, and my head is weak. Isn't there some nice girl who'd read and amuse you? Girls are quiet and like to play nurse. Don't know any. You know us, began Joe, and then laughed and stopped. So I do. Will you come, please? cried Laurie. I'm not quiet and nice, but I'll come if Mother will let me. I'll go ask her. Shut the window like a good boy and wait till I come. With that, Joe shouldered her broom and marched into the house, wondering what they would all say to her. Laurie was in a flutter of excitement at the idea of having come in company, and flew about to get ready, for, as Mrs. March said, he was a little gentleman, and did honor to the coming guest by brushing his curly pate, putting on a fresh collar, and trying to tidy up the room which, in spite of half a dozen servants, was anything but neat. Presently there came a loud ring, then a decided voice, asking for Mr. Lorry, and a surprised-looking servant came running up to announce a young lady. All right, show her up. It's Miss Jo, said Lorry, going to the door of his little parlor to meet Jo who appeared, looking rosy and quite at her ease, with a covered dish in one hand and Beth's three kittens in the other. Here I am, bag and baggage, she said briskly. Mother sent her love, and was glad if I could do anything for you. Meg wanted me to bring some of her blancmange. She makes it very nicely. And Beth, thought her cats would be comforting. I knew you'd laugh at them, but I couldn't refuse. She was so anxious to do something. It so happened that Beth's funny loan was just the thing. For in laughing over the kits, Laurie forgot his bashfulness and grew sociable at once. That looks too pretty to eat he said, smiling with pleasure, as Joe uncovered the dish and showed the blanc marsh, surrounded by a garland of green leaves and the scarlet flowers of Amy's pet geranium. It isn't anything, only they all felt kindly and wanted to show it. 
Tell the girl to put it away for your tea. It's so simple you can eat it, and being soft, it will slip down without hurting your sore throat. What a cozy room this is. It might be, if it was kept nice, but the maids are lazy, and I don't know how to make them mind. It worries me, though. I'll write it up in two minutes, for it only needs to have the hearth brushed. So. And the things made straight on the mantelpiece. So. And the books put there, and the bottles there. And your sofa turned from the light, and the pillows plumped up a bit. Now then, you're fixed. And so he was, for, as she laughed and talked, Joe had whisked things into place, and given quite a different air to the room. Laurie watched her in respectful silence, and when she beckoned him to his sofa, he sat down with a sigh of satisfaction, saying gratefully, How kind you are. Yes, that's what it wanted. Now please take the big chair and let me do something to amuse my company. No, I came to amuse you. Shall I read aloud? And Joe looked affectionately toward some inviting books nearby. Uh, thank you, I've read all those, and if you don't mind, I'd rather talk, answered Laurie. Not a bit. I'll talk all day if you'll only set me going. Beth says I never know when to stop. Is Beth the rosy one, who stays at home good deal and sometimes goes out with a little basket? asked Laurie with interest. Yes, that's Beth. She's my girl, and a regular good one she is too. The pretty one is Meg, and the curly-haired one is Amy, I believe. How did you find that out? Laurie colored up, but answered frankly. Why, you see, I often hear you calling to one another. And when I am alone up here, I can't help looking over at your house. You always seem to be having such good times. I beg your pardon for being so rude, but sometimes you forget to put down the curtain at the window where the flowers are. And when the lamps are lighted, it's like looking at the picture to see the fire and you all around the table with your mother. Her face is right opposite, and it looks so sweet behind the flowers. I can't help watching it. I haven't got any mother, you know. And Laurie poked the fire to hide a little twitching of the lips that he could not control. The solitary, hungry look in his eyes went straight to Joe's warm heart. She had been so simply taught that there was no nonsense in her head, and at fifteen she was as innocent and frank as any child. Laurie was sick and lonely, and feeling how rich she was in home and happiness, she gladly tried to share it with him. Her face was very friendly, and her sharp voice unusually gentle, as she said. We'll never draw that curtain any more, and I give you leave to look as much as you like. I just wish, though, instead of peeping, you'd come over and see us. Mother is so splendid, she'd do you heaps of good, and Beth would sing to you if I begged her to, and Amy would dance. Meg and I would make you laugh over our funny stage properties, and we'd have jolly times. Wouldn't your grandpa let you? I think he would, if your mother asked him. He's very kind, though he does not look so, and he lets me do what I like, pretty much, only he's afraid I might be a bother to strangers, began Laurie, brightening more and more. We are not strangers, we are neighbors, and you needn't think you'd be a bother. We want to know you, and I've been trying to do it this ever so long. We haven't been here a great while, you know, but we have got acquainted with all our neighbors but you. You see, Grandpa lives among his books, 
and doesn't mind much what happens outside. Mr. Brock, my tutor, doesn't stay here, you know, and I have no one to go about with me, so I just stop at home and get on as I can. That's bad. You ought to make an effort to go visit everywhere you are asked. Then you'll have plenty of friends, and pleasant places to go. Never mind being bashful. It won't last long if you keep going. Laurie turned red again, but wasn't offended at being accused of bashfulness. For there was so much goodwill in Joe, it was impossible not to take her blunt speeches as kindly as they were meant. Do you like your school? asked the boy, changing the subject after a little pause, during which he stared at the fire, and Joe looked about her, well pleased. Don't go to school. I am a businessman, a girl, I mean. I go to wait on my great aunt, and a dear cross old soul she is too, answered Joe. Laurie opened his mouth to ask another question but remembering just in time that it wasn't manners to make too many inquiries into people's affairs, he shut it again and looked uncomfortable. Joe liked his good braiding and didn't mind having a laugh at Aunt March, so she gave him a lively description of the fidgety old lady, her fat poodle, the parrot that talked Spanish, and the library where she reveled. Laurie enjoyed that immensely, and when she told about the prim old gentleman who came once to woo Aunt March, and in the middle of a fine speech, how Paul had tweaked his wig off to his great dismay, the boy lay back and laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks. And a maid popped her head in to see what was the matter. Oh, that does me no end of good. Tell on, please, he said, taking his face out of the sofa cushion, red and shining with merriment. Much elated with her success, Joe did tell on, all about their plays and plans, their hopes and fears for father and the most interesting events of the little world in which the sisters lived. Then they got to talking about books, and, to Joe's delight, she found that Laurie loved them as well as she did, and had read even more than herself. If you like them so much, come down and see ours. Grandfather is out, so he needn't be afraid, said Laurie, getting up. I'm not afraid of anything, returned Joe, with a toss of the head. I don't believe you are exclaimed the boy, looking at her with much admiration, though he privately thought she would have good reason to be a trifle afraid of the old gentleman, if she met him in some of his moods. The atmosphere of the whole house being summer-like, Laurie led the way from room to room, letting Joe stop to examine whatever struck her fancy. And so, at last they came to the library, where she clapped her hands and pranced as she always did when especially delighted. It was lined with books, and there were pictures and statues and distracting little cabinets full of coins and curiosities and sleepy hollow chairs and queer tables and bronzes. And best of all, a great open fireplace with quaint tiles all round it. What richness, sighed Joe, sinking into the depths of a velour chair and gazing about her with an air of intense satisfaction. Theodore Lawrence, you ought to be the happiest boy in the world, she added impressively. A fellow can't live on books, said Laurie, shaking his head as he perched on a table opposite. Before he could say more, a bell rang, and Joe flew up, exclaiming with alarm, Mercy me, it's your grandpa. Well, what if it is? You are not afraid of anything, you know, 
returned the boy, looking wicked. I think I am a little bit afraid of him. But I don't know why I should be. Marmy said I might come, and I don't think you're any worse for it, said Joe, composing herself, though she kept her eyes on the door. I'm a great deal better for it, and ever so much obliged. I'm only afraid you are very tired of talking to me. It was so pleasant I couldn't bear to stop, said Laurie gratefully. The doctor to see you, sir, and the maid beckoned as she spoke. Would you mind if I left you for a minute? I suppose I must see him, said Laurie. Don't mind me. I'm happy as a cricket here, answered Joe. Laurie went away, and his guest amused herself in her own way. She was standing before a fine portrait of the old gentleman when the door opened again, and, without turning, she said decidedly, I'm sure now that I shouldn't be afraid of him, for he's got kind eyes, though his mouth is grim, and he looks as if he had a tremendous will of his own. He isn't as handsome as my grandfather, but I like him. Thank you, ma'am, said a gruff voice behind her, and there, to her great dismay, stood old Mr. Lawrence. Poor Jo blushed till she couldn't blush any redder, and her heart began to beat uncomfortably fast as she thought what she had said. For a minute a wild desire to run away possessed her, but that was cowardly, and the girls would laugh at her. So she resolved to stay and get out of the scrape as she could. A second look showed her that the living eyes under the bushy eyebrows were kinder even than the painted ones, and there was a slight twinkle in them, which lessened her fear a good deal. The gruff voice was gruffer than ever, as the old gentleman said abruptly, after the dreadful pause. So, you're not afraid of me, eh? Not much, sir. And you don't think me as handsome as your grandfather? Not quite, sir. And I've got a tremendous will, have I? I only said I thought so. But you like me in spite of it. Yes, I do, sir. That answer pleased the old gentleman. He gave a short laugh, shook hands with her, and putting his finger under her chin, turned up her face, examined it gravely, and let it go, saying with a nod, You've got your grandfather's spirit, if you haven't his face. He was a fine man, my dear, but what is better, he was a brave and honest one, and I was proud to be his friend. Thank you, sir, and Joe was quite comfortable after that, for it suited her exactly. What have you been doing to this boy of mine, eh? was the next question, sharply put. Only trying to be neighborly, sir. And Joe told how her visit came out. You think he needs cheering up a bit, do you? Yes, sir. He seems a little lonely, and young folks would do him good, perhaps. We are only girls, but we should be glad to help if we could, for we don't forget the splendid Christmas present you sent us, said Joe eagerly. Tut, tut, tut. That was the boy's affair. How is the poor woman? Doing nicely, sir. And off went Joe, talking very fast, as she told all about the Hummels, in whom her mother had interested richer friends than they were. Just her father's way of doing good. I shall come and see your mother some fine day. Tell her so. There's the tea bell. We have it early on the boy's account. Come down and go on being neighborly. If you'd like to have me, sir. Shouldn't ask you if I didn't. And Mr. Lawrence offered her his arm with old-fashioned courtesy. What would Meg say to this, thought Joe, 
as she was marched away, while her eyes danced with fun as she imagined herself telling the story at home. Hey, why, what the dickens has come to the fellow? said the old gentleman, as Laurie came running downstairs and brought up with a start of surprise at the astounding sight of Joe, arm in arm with his redoubtable grandfather. I didn't know you'd come, sir, he began, as Joe gave him a triumphant little glance. That's evident by the way you racket downstairs. Come to your tea, sir, and behave like a gentleman and having pulled the boy's hair by way of a caress, Mr. Lawrence walked on, while Laurie went through a series of comic evolutions behind their backs, which nearly produced an explosion of laughter from Joe. The old gentleman did not say much, as he drank his four cups of tea, but he watched the young people, who soon chatted away like old friends, and the change in his grandson did not escape him. There was color, light, and life in the boy's face now, vivacity in his manner, and genuine merriment in his laugh. She's right, the lad is lonely. I'll see what these little girls can do for him, thought Mr. Lawrence, as he looked and listened. He liked Joe, for her odd, blunt ways suited him and she seemed to understand the boy almost as well as if she had been one herself. If the Lawrences had been what Joe called prim and pokey, she would not have got on at all, for such people always made her shy and awkward, but finding them free and easy she was so herself, and made a good impression. When they rose she proposed to go, but Laurie said he had something more to show her, and took her away to the conservatory, which had been lighted for her benefit. It seemed quite fairy-like to Joe. As she went up and down the walks, enjoying the blooming walls on either side, the soft light, the damp sweet air, and the wonderful vines and trees that hung about her, while her new friend cut the finest flowers till his hands were full. Then he tied them up, saying, with a happy look Joe liked to see, Please give these to your mother, and tell her I like the medicine she sent me very much. They found Mr. Lawrence standing before the fire in the great drawing-room, but Joe's attention was entirely absorbed by a grand piano which stood open. Do you play? she asked, turning to Laurie with a respectful expression. Sometimes, he answered modestly. Please do now. I want to hear it, so I can tell Beth. Won't you first? Don't know how. Too stupid to learn, but I love music dearly. So Laurie played, and Joe listened with her nose luxuriously buried in heliotrope and tea-roses. Her respect and regard for the Lawrence boy increased very much, for he played remarkably well and didn't put on any airs. She wished Beth could hear him, but she did not say so, only praised him till he was quite abashed, and his grandfather came to his rescue. That will do. That will do, young lad. Too many sugar plums are not good for him. His music isn't bad, but I hope he will do as well in more important things. Going? Well, I'm much obliged to you, and I hope you'll come again. My respect to your mother. Good night. Good night, Dr. Joe. He shook hands kindly, but looked as if something did not please him. When they got into the hall, Joe asked Laurie if she had said something amiss. He shook his head. No, it was me. He doesn't like to hear me play. Why not? I'll tell you some day. John is going home with you, as I can't. No need for that. I'm not a young lady, and it's only a step. Take care of yourself, won't you? 
Yes, but you will come again, I hope. If you promise to come and see us after you are well. I will. Good night, Laurie. Good night, Joe. Good night. When all the afternoon's adventures had been told, the family felt inclined to go visiting in a body, and for each found something very attractive in the big house on the other side of the hedge. Mrs. March wanted to talk of her father with the old man who had not forgotten him. Meg longed to walk in the conservatory. Beth sighed for the grand piano and Amy was eager to see the fine pictures and statues. Mother, why didn't Mr. Lawrence like to have Laurie play? asked Joe, who was of an inquiring disposition. I'm not sure, but I think it was because his son, Laurie's father, married an Italian lady, a musician, which displeased the old man, who is very proud. The lady was good and lovely and accomplished, but he did not like her and never saw her son after he married. They both died when Laurie was a little child, and then his grandfather took him home. I fancy the boy, who was born in Italy, is not very strong, and the old man is afraid of losing him, which makes him so careful. Laurie comes naturally by his love of music for he is like his mother, and I dare say his grandfather fears that he may want to be a musician. At any rate, his skill reminds him of the woman he did not like. And so he glowered, as Joe said. Dear me, how romantic, exclaimed Meg. How silly, said Joe. Let him be a musician if he wants to, and not plague his life out, sending him to college, when he hates to go. That's why he has such handsome black eyes and pretty manners, I suppose. Italians are always nice, said Meg, who was a little sentimental. What do you know about his eyes and his manners? You never spoke to him, hardly, cried Joe, who was not sentimental. I saw him at the party and what you tell shows that he knows how to behave. That was a nice little speech about the medicine Mother sent him. He meant the blancmange, I suppose. How stupid you are, child. He meant you, of course. Did he? And Joe opened her eyes, as if it had never occurred to her before. I never saw such a girl. You don't know a compliment when you get it, said Meg with the air of a young lady who knew all about the matter. I think they are great nonsense, and I'll thank you not to be silly and spoil my fun. Laurie's a nice boy, and I like him, and I won't have any sentimental stuff about compliments and such rubbish. We'll all be good to him because he hasn't got any mother, and he may come over and see us. Mayn't he, Mommy? Yes, Joe, your little friend is very welcome, and I hope Meg will remember that children should be children as long as they can. I don't call myself a child, and I'm not in my teens yet, observed Amy. What do you say, Beth? I was thinking about our pilgrim's progress, answered Beth, who had not heard a word how we get out of the slough and through the wicket gate by resolving to be good, and up the steep hill by trying. And that may be the house over there, full of splendid things, is going to be our palace beautiful. We have got to get by the lions first, said Joe, as if she rather liked the prospect. Chapter 6. Beth Finds the Palace Beautiful The big house did prove a palace beautiful, though it took some time for all to get in, and Beth found it very hard to pass the lions. Old Mr. Lawrence was the biggest one, but after he had called, said something funny or kind to each one of the girls. 
and talked over old times with their mother. Nobody felt much afraid of him, except timid Beth. The other lion was the fact that they were poor, and Laurie rich, for this made them shy of accepting favors which they could not return. But after a while they found that he considered them the benefactors, and could not do enough to show how grateful he was for Mrs. March's motherly welcome, their cheerful society, and the comfort he took in that humble home of theirs. So they soon forgot their pride, and interchanged kindness without stopping to think which was the greater. All sorts of pleasant things happened about that time, for the new friendship flourished like grass in spring. Everyone liked Laurie, and he privately informed his tutor that the Marches were regularly splendid girls. With the delightful enthusiasm of youth, they took the solitary boy into their midst and made much of him, and he found something very charming in the innocent companionship of these simple-hearted girls. Never having known mother or sisters, he was quick to feel the influences they brought about him, and their busy, lively ways made him ashamed of the indolent life he led. He was tired of books, and found people so interesting now that Mr. Brook was obliged to make very unsatisfactory reports, for Laurie was always playing truant and running over to the marches. Never mind, let him take a holiday and make it up afterward, said the old gentleman. The good lady next door says he is studying too hard and needs young society, amusement, and exercise. I suspect she is right and that I've been coddling the fellow as if I'd been his grandmother. Let him do what he likes, as long as he is happy. He can't get into mischief in that little nunnery over there, and Mrs. Marge is doing more for him than we can. What good times they had, to be sure. Such plays and tableau, such sleigh rides and skating frolics such pleasant evenings in the old parlor, and now and then such gay little parties at the great house. May could walk in the conservatory whenever she liked and revel in bouquets. Joe browsed over the new library voraciously and convulsed the old gentleman with her criticism. Amy copied pictures and enjoyed beauty to her heart's content, and Laurie played Lord of the Manor in the most delightful style. But Beth, though yearning for the grand piano, could not pluck up courage to go to the mansion of bliss, as Meg called it. She went once with Joe, but the old gentleman, not being aware of her infirmity, stared at her so hard from under his heavy eyebrows, and said, Hey! so loud that he frightened her so much her feet chattered on the floor. She never told her mother, and she ran away, declaring she would never go there any more, not even for the dear piano. No persuasions or incitements could overcome her fear, till the fact coming to Mr. Lawrence's ear in some mysterious way, he set about mending matters. During one of the brief calls he made, he artfully led the conversation to music, and talked away about great singers whom he had seen, fine organs he had heard, and told such charming anecdotes that Beth found it impossible to stay in her distant corner, but crept nearer and nearer, as if fascinated. At the back of his chair she stopped and stood listening, with her great eyes wide open and her cheeks red with excitement of this unusual performance. Taking no more notice of her than if she had been a fly, Mr. Lawrence talked on about Laurie's lessons and teachers, and presently, as if the idea had just occurred to him, he said to Mrs. March, The boy neglects his music now, and I'm glad of it, for he was getting too fond of it, 
but the piano suffers for want of use. Wouldn't some of your girls like to run over and practice on it now and then, just to keep it in tune, you know, ma'am? Beth took a step forward and pressed her hands tightly together to keep from clapping them, for this was an irresistible temptation, and the thought of practicing on that splendid instrument quite took her breath away. Before Mrs. March could reply, Mr. Lawrence went on with an odd little nod and smile. They needn't see you speak to anyone, but run in at any time, for I am shut up in my study at the other end of the house. Laurie is out a great deal, and the servants are never near the drawing room after nine o'clock. Her nose rose, as if going, and Beth made up her mind to speak, for that last arrangement left nothing to be desired. Please tell the young ladies what I say, and if they don't care to come, why, never mind. Here, her little hand slipped into his and Beth looked up at him with a face full of gratitude, as she said, in her earnest yet timid way. Oh, sir, they do care, very, very much. Are you the musical girl? he asked, without any startling hay, as he looked down at her very kindly. I'm Beth, I love it dearly, and I'll come if you are quite sure nobody will hear me and be disturbed, she added, fearing to be rude and trembling at her own boldness as she spoke. Not a soul, my dear. The house is empty half the day, so come and drum away as much as you like, and I shall be obliged to you. How kind you are, sir. Beth blushed like a rose under the friendly look he wore. But she was not frightened now, and gave the hand a grateful squeeze, because she had no words to thank him for the precious gift he had given her. The old gentleman softly stroked the hair off her forehead, and, stooping down, he kissed her, saying, in a tone few people ever heard, I had a little girl once with eyes like these. God bless you, my dear. Good day, ma'am. And away he went, in a great hurry. Beth had a rapture with her mother, and then rushed up to impart the glorious news to her family of invalids. As the girls were not home, how blithely she sang that evening, and how they all laughed at her, because she woke Amy in the night by playing the piano on her face in her sleep. Next day, having seen both the old and young gentlemen out of the house, Beth, after two or three retreats, fairly got in at the side door, and made her way as noiselessly as any mouse to the drawing room where her idol stood. Quite by accident, of course, some pretty, easy music lay on the piano, and with trembling fingers and frequent stops to listen and look about, Beth at last touched the great instrument, and straight away forgot her fear, herself, and everything else but the unspeakable delight which her music gave her, for it was like the voice of a beloved friend. She stayed till Hannah came to take her home to dinner but she had no appetite, and could only sit and smile upon everyone in a general state of beautitude. After that, the little brown hood slipped through the hedge nearly every day, and the great drawing-room was haunted by a tuneful spirit that came and went unseen. She never knew that Mr. Lawrence opened his study door to hear the old-fashioned airs he liked. She never saw Laurie mount guard in the hall to warn the servants away. She never suspected that the exercise books and new songs which she found in the rack were put there for her a special benefit. And when he talked to her about music at home, 
She only thought how kind he was to tell things that helped her so much. So she enjoyed herself heartily, and found, what isn't always the case, that her granted wish was all she had hoped. Perhaps it was, because she was so grateful for this blessing, that a greater was given her. At any rate, she deserved both. Mother, I am going to work Mr. Lawrence a pair of slippers. He is so kind to me, I must thank him, and I don't know any other way. Can I do it? asked Beth, a few weeks after that eventful call of his. Yes, dear, it will please him very much, and be a nice way of thanking him. The girls will help you about them, and I will pay for the making up replied Mrs. March, who took peculiar pleasure in granting Beth's request, because she so seldom asked anything for herself. After many serious discussions with Meg and Joe, the pattern was chosen, the materials bought, and the slippers begun. A cluster of grave yet cheerful pansies on a deep purple ground was pronounced very appropriate and pretty and Beth worked away early and late, with occasional lifts over hard parts. She was a nimble little needlewoman, and they were finished before anyone got tired of them. Then she wrote a short, simple note, and with Laura's help got them smuggled onto the study table one morning before the old gentleman was up. When this excitement was over, Beth waited to see what would happen. All day passed, and a part of the next day, before any acknowledgement arrived. And she was beginning to fear she had offended her crotchety friend. On the afternoon of the second day, she went out to do an errand, and give poor Joanna, the invalid doll, her daily exercise. As she came up the street, on her return, she saw three, yes, four heads popping in and out of the parlor windows. And the moment they saw her, several hands were waved, and several joyful voices screamed. Here's a letter from the old gentleman. Come quick and read it. Oh, Beth, he sent you, began Amy, gesticulating with unseemly energy. But she got no further, for Joe quenched her by slamming down the window. Beth hurried on in a flutter of suspense. At the door, her sister ceased and bore her to the parlor, in a triumphal procession, all pointing and all saying at once, Look there! Look there! Beth did look, and turned pale with delight and surprise, for there stood a little cabinet piano, with a letter lying on the glossy lid, directed like a signboard to... Miss Elizabeth March. For me, gasped Beth, holding on to Joe, and feeling as if she should tumble down. It was such an overwhelming thing altogether. Yes, all for you, my precious. Isn't it splendid of him? Don't you think he's the dearest old man in the world? Here's the key in the letter. We didn't open it, but we're dying to know what he says, cried Joe, hugging her sister and offering the note. You read it. I can't. I feel so queer. Oh, it is too lovely. And Beth hid her face in Joe's apron, quite upset by her present. Joe opened the paper and began to laugh, for the first words she saw were, Miss March, dear madam, how nice it sounds. I wish someone would write to me so, said Amy, who thought the old-fashioned address very elegant. I have had many pairs of slippers in my life, but I have never had any that suited me so well as yours, continues Joe. Heart's ease is my favorite flower, and these will always remind me of the gentle giver. I like to pay my debts so I know you will allow the old gentleman 
to send you something which once belonged to the little granddaughter he lost. With hearty thanks and best wishes, I remain your grateful friend and humble servant, James Lawrence. Dear Beth, that's an honor to be proud of, I'm sure. Laurie told me how fond Mr. Lawrence used to be of the child who died, and how he kept all her things carefully. Just think, he's given you her piano. That comes of having big blue eyes and loving music, said Joe, trying to soothe Beth, who trembled and looked more excited than she had ever been before. See the cunning brackets to hold candles, and the nice green silk pocket up, with a gold rose in the middle, and a pretty rack and stool, all complete, added Meg, opening the instrument and displaying its beauties. Your humble servant, James Lawrence. Only think of his writing that to you. I'll tell the girls. They'll think it's splendid, said Amy, much impressed by the note. Try it, honey. Let's hear the sound of the baby piano, said Hannah who always took a share in the family joys and sorrows. So Beth tried it, and everyone pronounced it the most remarkable piano ever heard. It had evidently been newly tuned and put in apple pie order. But perfect as it was, I think the real charm lay in the happiest of all happy faces which leaned over it as Beth lovingly touched the beautiful black and white keys and pressed the bright pedals. You'll have to go and thank him, said Joe, by way of a joke, for the idea of the child's really going never entered her head. Yes, I mean to. I guess I'll go now, before I get frightened thinking about it. And to the utter amazement of the assembled family. Beth walked deliberately down the garden, through the hedge, and in at the Lawrence's door. Well, I wish I may die if it ain't the queerest thing I ever see. The piano has turned her head. She'd never have gone in her right mind, cried Hannah, staring after her, while the girls were rendered quite speechless by the miracle. They would have been still more amazed if they had seen what Beth did afterward. If you will believe me, she went and knocked at the study door before she gave herself time to think. And when a gruff voice called out, Come in! She did go in, right up to Mr. Lawrence, who looked quite taken aback, and held out her hand, saying, with only a small quaver in her voice, I came to thank you, sir, for... But she didn't finish, for he looked so friendly that she forgot her speech, and, only remembering that he had lost the little girl he loved, she put both arms around his neck and kissed him. If the roof of the house had suddenly flown off, the old gentleman wouldn't have been more astonished. But he liked it. Oh, dear, yes. He liked it amazingly, and was so touched and pleased by that confiding little kiss that all his crustiness vanished, and he just sat her on his knee and laid his wrinkled cheek against her rosy one, feeling as if he had got his own little granddaughter back again. Beth ceased to fear him from that moment and sat there talking to him as cosily as if she had known him all her life. For love casts out fear, and gratitude can conquer pride. When she went home, he walked with her to her own gate, shook hands cordially, and touched his hat as he marched back again, looking very stately and erect, like a handsome, soldierly old gentleman as he was. When the girls saw that performance, Joe began to dance a jig, by way of expressing her satisfaction. Amy nearly fell out of the window in her surprise, and Meg exclaimed, with uplifted hands, Well, I do believe the world is coming to an end. <laughs>